Hey guys, sorry it's been a while since my last review video. I recently started a new job, so I've just been very tired when I get home, and also I've been cleaning and reorganizing my room, which might not sound like a hard thing to do, but there is so much shit in my room right now that, that it took me literally a month to actually finish the whole damn thing. So, a lot of my time has been occupied with either work or that. But since I actually think 2022 was a really damn good year for film, I decided to do a list of my top 15 favorite films to come out last year. Now, keep in mind, this is just a list of my personal favorites. I'm not saying all the films on this list are necessarily the best. They're just my personal favorites. Number 15 on my list is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Now, I do feel the Marvel Cinematic Universe kind of hit its peak with Endgame, and I do feel a lot of the post-Endgame MCU movies have been kind of directionless. That being said, I really loved Spider-Man No Way Home, and I really loved this movie. Now, I liked the first Doctor Strange movie, but I thought this was so much more creative and imaginative. Now, the film is directed by Sam Raimi, and you could really see Raimi's horror roots in this, to a point where it actually does become kind of a superhero horror film as it goes on, and it gets surprisingly bloody and violent for a PG-13 Marvel movie. And I know I'm not the first person to make this joke, but it really does feel like this was secretly Evil Dead 4 that Sam Raimi just disguised as a Marvel movie. I mean, the Deadites do kind of show up in it, and there is a book in the movie that's very similar to the Necronomicon from the Evil Dead franchise. And of course, there's a Bruce Campbell cameo, which is hilarious, and the ending really does feel right out of Army of Darkness. And I really appreciated that this film felt more like a Sam Raimi film first and an MCU movie second. Number 14 on my list is Nope, the recent sci-fi horror film from Jordan Peele. Now, I do think I probably liked Get Out and Us a little bit better than this overall, but this movie has... One of the most haunting scenes I've seen in a recent horror film. Like, there's something about this scene, I don't know if it's the sound design, or the implications of what happens to these poor people, or the fact that we get to know some of these people beforehand and really empathize with them before this happens to them, but there's something about this one particular scene in the movie, and people who have seen the film probably know what I'm talking about, that just really got under my skin. Other than that scene, the movie's actually really fun and even quite funny at points, but again, there's something about that scene that really did haunt me, and then again, horror should make you uncomfortable at times. Now, there is social commentary in the film, but it's not as overt as it was in Get Out and Us, and it's not so much about race. I mean, race comes up a little bit in the film, but the movie's more so a commentary on how we as a society are kind of addicted to spectacle and the kinds of things we would do for entertainment. And it's also sort of a commentary on how people sometimes exploit real-life tragedies or even their own personal trauma for monetary gain. But I really recommend Nope. I thought it was a really interesting take on the whole UFO concept, and it also felt very Lovecraftian at points. And, in speaking of doing anything for entertainment, number 13 on my list is a movie that's going to either cause this list to gain or lose credibility, depending on your mindset of these kinds of movies, but number 13 is Jackass Forever. Now, I would like to think that my sense of humor has matured a little bit since high school, but then when I watch the Jackass movies, I'm like, yeah, no it hasn't. Because... I like Jackass. I'm both kind of ashamed and kind of not ashamed to admit it, but I really do love the Jackass movies. I didn't grow up so much with the show, but the movies I would watch all the time when I was in high school. And it was great seeing these guys again inflict massive amounts of pain on themselves and each other. 
And I also gotta say, if you have testicles, you are going to cringe while watching this movie. And I'm honestly perplexed as to how some of these men still have testicles after all this. Number 12 on my list is The Fablemans, which I actually saw after I first made the list. And when I saw the movie, I immediately knew that I had to change the list now because I loved The Fablemans. And I honestly think this is probably Steven Spielberg's best movie in years and it feels like Spielberg's most personal film. The movie is a fictionalized account of Steven Spielberg's childhood. Now, I don't know how accurate this is to his real life, but this was an absolutely beautiful and deeply moving coming-of-age story. And the movie starts off really light-hearted, where you see this really sweet family dynamic, and you see this family really encouraging this kid's dreams, but as it goes on, you start to see cracks in the facade, and you realize things are not completely right here, and it gets really sad, but never outright depressing, and the film still has a really uplifting message about following your dreams, and the movie also feels like a real love letter to filmmaking and film in general. And my god, Michelle Williams in this movie was a freaking powerhouse. There's also a pretty awesome David Lynch cameo in the movie. Number 11 on the list is The Northman, a brilliant and ungodly bleak revenge drama. And Robert Eggers does an amazing job at making it feel like you're in this time period, and the film is just a brilliant commentary on revenge and how revenge can corrupt the soul. And I love how in this movie there are no real heroes. Like, you see the supposed protagonist of the film do things that are just as evil, if not more evil, than the actions of the antagonist. In fact, there are moments where the antagonist of the film is the more honorable character, and ultimately it's the main character's quest for revenge that ends up being his downfall. Now, even though the film is meant to be a reality-based historical drama, there are points where it almost plays out like a fantasy film, although the fantasy elements could technically be explained as hallucinations or nightmares. Now, while this is not an outright horror film like The Lighthouse or The Witch, I actually really do feel like this movie fits in thematically with those movies, because all three of Robert Eggers' films so far have definitely seemed to have a running theme of gender and belief systems. And as pretentious as this is probably going to sound, Robert Eicher's films really do feel like literature on film, which is why I would love to see him do more outright literary adaptations. I mean, you could argue that The Northman is kind of a loose adaptation of Shakespeare's Hamlet and some elements of Macbeth as well, like Bjork's character in the movie definitely seems to be sort of a take on the Weird Sisters from from Macbeth, and I believe the movie is also based on an ancient Scandinavian legend as well, but I would love to see Robert Eggers do more literary adaptations, like I know he's doing Nosferatu, which is obviously based on Dracula, but I would love to see him adapt Frankenstein. I think he would do an amazing job with that story. Number 10 is She Said, which is based on the true story of the journalist who exposed the whole Harvey Weinstein scandal. Scandal. It's an extremely well-made and incredibly well-acted journalism drama in the vein of stuff like Spotlight and All the President's Men. It's interesting that we finally get a Hollywood film about the whole Harvey Weinstein scandal, considering Harvey Weinstein was a major player in Hollywood, and you know a lot of the people working on this movie have probably worked with or at least crossed paths with Harvey Weinstein in the past. I mean, Ashley Judd, who was one of Weinstein's many victims, actually plays herself in this movie and does a pretty good job. And it's just genuinely scary how much power this man had in Hollywood and how he was able to get away with this for so long and you see in this film how much these journalists have to fight and how many hurdles they have to go through to get this article out there, to get the truth out there. And
And had they not done what they did, Weinstein probably still would be out there today doing this shit. I highly recommend She Said. I thought it was a very good movie. Number nine on my list is The Batman. Now, I'm already a huge Batman fan to begin with, but I loved how this movie was really a David Fincher-esque serial killer drama that just happened to feature Batman as the lead protagonist. And the movie almost plays out like a horror film in some scenes. I thought Robert Pattinson was a great Bruce Wayne slash Batman, and Paul Dano gives a genuinely chilling performance as the Riddler reimagined in this film as a serial killer, very much inspired by real-life serial killer The Zodiac. Number eight on my list is Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Now, it's funny that 2022 kind of became the year of Pinocchio, because last year there were three separate adaptations of that story. Now, I haven't seen the other two, but from what I can tell, it seems like del Toro's version is definitely the best. Now, I've never read the original Pinocchio novel, but I have seen several of the adaptations, including the Walt Disney version from the 1940s, which was one of my favorite Disney movies growing up. Now, it seems like this film is probably true in spirit to the original story. At the same time, this is also purely Guillermo del Toro's take on the whole Pinocchio story, where it's actually set in fascist Italy during the rise of Mussolini, which I thought was a brilliant idea. And the movie actually seems to fit in thematically with Guillermo del Toro's films like Devil's Backbone and Pan's Labyrinth, where it's sort of a childhood fantasy story with the backdrop of war and fascism and about how war leads to the loss of childhood innocence. And the film actually gets into a lot of philosophical themes about death and the afterlife and how, regardless of what awaits us in the afterlife, we need to enjoy our time on Earth. And while the film is deeply moving, it's also quite funny, too, and I think kids can still enjoy it despite all the political and philosophical themes that obviously would appeal more to adults. Number seven on my list is Terrifier 2, a movie that I honestly thought was better than it had any right to be. Now, I liked the first Terrifier movie alright, but to me it felt almost more like a collection of death scenes that were kind of strung together, whereas the sequel definitely had more of a plot to it, and I've never seen the anthology film that Terrifier is a spin-off of, but I honestly thought Terrifier 2 really did blow the first movie out of the water, and I was really impressed with this film. And it was definitely a throwback to the 80s slasher films, but there was this period in the late 80s after the first Nightmare on Elm Street movie came out, where a lot of slasher films embraced the supernatural and also got kind of bonkers, and Terrifier 2 seems to specifically be a tribute to those kinds of slasher movies. And this really did remind me of some of the best Nightmare on Elm Street sequels, namely Dream Warriors and Dream Master, particularly with the final girl of the movie developing supernatural powers of her own and becoming almost kind of a superhero going up against Art the Clown. And this has one of the best final girls I've seen in a modern slasher film. Now, when I first saw the movie, I initially thought it was longer than it needed to be, but honestly, the more I thought about it, I'm actually really glad that we basically got a slasher movie epic. And there's a surprising amount of mythology at work in the film that is not fully explained, but we get little hints of it. And I'm really excited to see what Damien Leone does with Terrifier 3, which definitely seems to be happening at this point, especially considering how well this movie did. Number six on my list is Bones and All, and I gotta say, what a great year 2022 was for horror, from the more cheesy and over-the-top, like Terrifier 2, to the more subdued and dramatic, like Bones and All. Now, Bones and All is a body horror film on the surface, but as you go deeper, you realize it's actually a really sad and tragic drama about this young girl who is afflicted with what 
what is either a supernatural curse or some kind of genetic disease that compels her to cannibalism. And we follow her as she's on the run, and she meets other cannibals, including a young man that she falls in love with. It's just a really well-made and well-acted horror drama film, which could be ridiculous if handled the wrong way, but because of how well-directed it is and how well-acted it all is, you buy it. And the film has some genuinely moving and genuinely creepy performances. Especially from Mark Rylance, I hope I'm saying his name right, who gives one of the best villain performances I've seen this year as Sully. Number five on my list is Crimes of the Future, David Cronenberg's return to the body horror genre. I'm a huge David Cronenberg fan, and it was great to see him back with this movie. Now, I don't want to say it's necessarily a return to form for Cronenberg, because I don't think Cronenberg ever really lost it. Even when he moved away from outright horror films, to me there was a thematic element that ran all throughout Cronenberg's body of work. But this movie really did feel like an extension and an amalgamation of the themes that you saw in Videodrome and Crash. The movie is set in a dystopic future where it appears that the environment has collapsed, or at least is on the verge of collapse, and humanity is now entering the next phase of human evolution, and there are certain forces that are trying to stop this new evolution. And because humans can no longer feel pain, surgery has become the new form of sensation, and it's also kind of become the new sex. It's also become a new art form where certain people have their bodies altered in front of a live audience as a form of performance art. But it's a fascinating film with a lot of really interesting questions about what it means to be human and where we're heading as a society and as a species. And as is the case with a lot of David Cronenberg's films, he doesn't really say one way or the other whether this evolution is good or bad. Rather, he's showing it as it is and leaving it up to the audience's interpretation. He also doesn't seem to be judging any of these people. Rather, he's showing them as they are. Now, I don't know if this is going to be his last movie or not, but if it is, this would be a hell of a swan song for his career. And yes, I did share between takes. Thanks for noticing. Number four on my list is Ty West's Pearl, which is a prequel to his film X, which came out earlier in 2022, explaining the origins of the villain of X. Now, X almost made it to this list, but I figured I can only have one or the other on the list, and while X was really damn good, Pearl was a goddamn masterpiece. Now, it's already rare for sequels to be better than their predecessor, but it's especially rare for a prequel to be actually better than the film it's a prequel to, let alone a prequel that came out the same year as its predecessor, and I really loved how this was a very different film from X. X is more of a slasher film, whereas this is actually a hardcore psychological drama. And Mia Goth gives a performance in this movie that is honestly Oscar-worthy, and I think probably the best performance of her career so far, although I recently saw her in Infinity Pool, and she's also really damn good in that. And she does an amazing job at actually getting you to empathize with this character a little bit, because even though the character of Pearl is already kind of fucked up, even in the beginning, you get the idea that had she actually been able to achieve her dreams and get away from this oppressive environment, things might have turned out differently for her. Number three on my list is The Black Phone, and like I said, what a great year 2022 was for horror. The Black Phone was an absolutely brilliant film, and a great mix between a ghost story and a serial killer film, as well as a coming-of-age drama. And Ethan Hawke gives a genuinely chilling performance as The Grabber, another great villain performance from this year. Now, the movie is based on a short story 
story by Joe Hill, who is Stephen King's son, and there are some definite Stephen King elements in the movie. There's elements of it, and elements of The Shining as well. But yeah, damn good movie, and a great example of how there are still some great mainstream horror films out there. Like, a horror film these days doesn't always have to be an indie film in order to be good. Number two on my list is Darren Aronofsky's The Whale, a profoundly moving and absolutely devastating human drama. And Brendan Fraser gives what is easily the best performance of his career by far. The film is about a morbidly obese college professor who is trying desperately to reconnect with his teenage daughter who he hasn't seen since she was a little girl. It's an absolutely heart-wrenching film, and I was actually actually on the verge of bawling in the theater. Thank God I was sitting by myself. Now, at first glance, the title The Whale might seem like some really bad fat joke, but it actually is really important to the story, because the story has a lot of allusions to Moby Dick, which might seem kind of random, but trust me, it makes sense in context. And my number one favorite film of 2022 was The Menu, a really clever horror comedy that is also a biting satire on the food world and on the restaurant industry and how people within the service industry are treated. It's also very much a commentary on class and how the upper class exploits the lower classes, and in the movie you have this chef who runs his restaurant almost like a cult, and he's essentially getting revenge on these rich elites who he feels have really drained all the joy out of cooking for him. It's one of those movies where there are moments where you really are rooting for the villain, because these people he's going after are awful. At the same time, though, there are moments in the film where you really empathize with them because they are still human beings at the end of the day. And there are also moments in the film where you see how hypocritical Ray Fiennes' character is because he's just as elitist and just as classist as these rich assholes that he's going after. It's a really well-written movie. And I don't believe I'm the first person to make this joke, but this movie almost feels like Midsummer if Midsummer were an episode of Hell's Kitchen. And while there is social commentary in the film, and there certainly are deeper themes in the film, the way the film ends, it also kind of suggests that maybe we shouldn't take this that seriously and just enjoy the ride. And the movie succeeds at being very suspenseful, but also fucking hilarious. But yeah, The Menu is a great movie. It's very well made and very well acted from people like Ray Fiennes, John Leguizamo, Nicholas Holt, and Anna Taylor-Joy really does steal a lot of this movie. Now, before I end this video, I just want to give some honorable mentions... Of course, X, which, like I said, would have made it onto the list if Pearl didn't exist. Metal Lords, Clerks 3, which I know is divisive, but I really enjoyed it. Bullet Train, Bodies, 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 Smile, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, Men, and Barbarian. And Violent Night was also really damn good. So yeah, that was my list of my favorite films from 2022. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this list, and let me know in the comments what some of your favorite films of this year were.